Uh, so thanks uh, for being here. It's a bit of a strange thing to be back in a room with lots of people, but it's really nice to see you all, and especially with people who do lots of different things. Uh, metals are very, you know, different to what I've traditionally been involved with, but, but um, I'm going to talk to you today about some of the stuff we've been looking at with, uh, in soft matter systems, particularly polymer materials. So I titled the talk Methods for Measuring Network Heterogeneity in Cross-Link Polymer Network and Implications for Corrosion Performance, because um, I thought it might please Stuart because I thought that's the kind of where we're coming from in terms of, and I, I sort of started off with his cartoon, which, which I like. And I, I think um, it was a, it's a starting point for us trying to think about, you know, what goes on in a coating. And I think when we think about a polymer coating, we often think of a, a coating that is a, a very good barrier layer. And some of my co colleagues would say, you know, water, water isn't getting near to the substrate. But I think what we've begun to realize and what we've been thinking about is that Yes, water has a permeability. It might be slow depending on the on the state and, and the you know whether or not it's a semi-crystalline polymer or not. Um, it will get through a layer over time. And so I think we're trying to understand what are the the mechanisms by which we get to this to this sort of a, this sort of volcano at the end. You know, what is this bad thing that we don't want to happen in our in our coatings um, that we apply and are going to hopefully, like Simon would tell us, they are going to be they are very important in trying to reduce our um, our impact on the environment um, and protecting things that we value, um, infrastructure and other uh, materials um, which are expensive to replace and, uh, and costly. So, so that, I think that's where we're coming from, trying to understand what, what's going on inside this um, in this layer here, which has been a sort of a, you know, people call it a binder, people call it a resin, but to me it's polymer, it's a polymer layer. It's often quite, you know, a large fraction of the material. So we, we like to look at very simple polymer thin films, and so. Like Suzanne mentioned, a lot of the um, uh, techniques that we like to use, it might be quite difficult to actually rep be representative of the thick films that you know someone's doing um, in a in a shipyard or in a in another factory to make a, a, a stable epoxy coating that's you know be painted on by maybe not an expert operator. So the question is that is what we do on a thin film? Is it you know we always try and check ourselves? Is it is it going to be comparable to uh, to what is done um, in the in the, in the everyday uh, circumstances and environment so so i'm going to go back to this um and try and convince you that um so my colleague former colleague uh, now at manchester richard jones knows a lot about electromicroscopy and there's some really good um literature that goes back from the 1970s uh, on tm and this sort of nodules idea and this is this is this is i haven't even cited this paper sorry um but i can i can dig you out the reference so this is TM. This is a TM image of a replica of a fracture surface for an EPON uh, data system. And so this sample was cured for 24 hours at room temperature. And then it doesn't say, but I, I seen it. And then they just dumped it in, um, cycled back and forth, and uh, in humidity. So whether or not this any morphology on here is due to um, the repeated uh, immersion or you know exposure to humidity or not is not clear. But what's interesting in the, in the even systems that have not undergone this kind of cycling of humidity, these kind of nodules have been a sort of a recurring theme um, in epoxy literature and in polymer literature in general. Um, and um, so, so these are generally agreed to be more cross-linked and consequently higher electron density than the, the matrix surrounded by. Um, so, that, yeah, my aim in this sort of talk was to try and sort of revisit you know, what do we know about nodules? What are the ways can we get used to get away from the um, uh, uh, electron microscopy approach? Because there are problems with this. And, and for those of you who've read the Faraday discussions in 1979, it's a real page turner. Um, it really is. Um, there's a heated discussion about, um, you know, um, whether or not people have seen um, these kinds of, they call them salt and pepper pot type structures in electron microscopy. And so, so they've seen, been seen in, in all sorts of um, instances using defocused TM, and and this was in this was in a pure polystyrene film, and this is this is by Ned Thomas, who formerly of MIT, and now uh, I think he's at Texas or something now. Uh, so, and these are thought to be an artifact, and and, and they make some good um, uh, uh, points about why they think that's the case. Um, so, in order for this for this structure that you see in this defocus TM to be real, you must see it in all the defocus series that you do. So if you don't see a whole series of defocuses um, and then uh, see that repeat recurring uh, length scale in those, then then just bin it and say, you know, they've not done their analysis properly. So this is, a, um, this is the discussion where it was discussed and it's sort of locked away in the Faraday discussions, but 
a really good forum for discussion on these kinds of things as well. So, yeah, what is the structure? And, you know, we'd like to do all that we can to, to understand this, this nanoscale structure or, or the morphology in these systems. And what we'd like is a full 3D characterization of the sort of the molecular composition and ordering at the molecular level. And being hard task maskers, we'd like to do it under ambient too. I know we do like high vacuum stuff as, um, as well, but, you know, we like to see this stuff when it's wet or, you know, exposed to, to ambient because partly because it makes our life easier not having to wait for vacuums to come down. But so what I'm going to talk about is just a, a bunch of techniques that I think are, uh, are suitable to try and uh, tackle these kinds of questions that we have that would hopefully tell us about the morphology and, and diffusion in these kinds of materials. And so this is a, uh, this is a picture from um, uh, an actor sponsored project with um, Alex Shaff Shackelford and uh, my colleague in the audience, Professor Patrick Fairclough. So this was a nice piece of equipment that was built um, through, throughout his PhD, um, not bought, and really, really well designed and thought through. And so the idea was that uh, Alec and Patrick uh, were posed the task of being able to measure free volume uh, with the guys at Felling, Tony Wright and Colin Cameron. And so they met, were able to build this quite reasonably cost, uh, low cost um, PALS equipment. And uh, uh, Joe Orgel in the audience has taken on the task of, of manning this and, and running this in Sheffield. Uh, in the, it's been moved up to the physics department. So, so the idea is you have a, a sodium-22 source, so um, a radioactive source that produces um, uh, uh, positrons. And these positrons um, probe the, the free volume, whatever the free volume is. We can talk about that another time inside your material. And then by doing that a number of times, you get the, the annihilation time for it to encounter an electron and annihilate. So you get like an initial creation of the, the positron and then you get an annihilation. And the difference between when you start the clock and stop the clock tells you about the material uh, that it's, it's, it's uh, decayed into. And so you can do that by placing your, these are your two coincidence counts at the two tubes and your sample goes in here. A sandwich between, with the, the, the sodium 22 sandwich between the, uh, the samples, which is, uh, quite scary handling a, a radioactive source, but we get get in there, I think. And so I found this really nice paper in the literature from 2011, which I think is good, and it sort of points to what, what we think free volume is telling us. Um, there is a correlation between free volume, hole size, and penetrant band of valve volume. So they've helpfully done it in a really strange um, black and dashed lines, um, but basically um, they, they segregate in terms to uh, when they when the solvent is greater than the, the, the free volume in your material and when it's less, so your diffusion, I see the way around, isn't it? Yeah, a solvent penetrant becomes smaller than pH, total mass uptake continues to increase, supporting the idea that larger whole volume size increase the probability that the free volume is interconnected. So this idea of, you know, how do we get migration of water through our thing is to do with the free volume um, in, these, in these networks. Um, and so that's what, that's what the... the, the um, that's the implication of what the, the PALS equipment can tell us. It can tell us about um, the size of the free volume. In this instance, they're between like 77 and 80. Um, but when we think about it, water is, you know, I just did a back of the envelope calculation. That's probably around about the magnitude. But, you know, we aren't going to be able to stop water getting inside our systems, um, no matter how hard we try. And then what, what is the nature of the water inside these systems? So here's a, a nice cartoon of, a, of, a, of an epoxy network. And here we have the water, um, the free water, and then here we have the hydrogen bonded network, uh, hydrogen bonded water. So, so here's the possible hydrogen bonds between absorbed water molecules. And so you can see you've got three types of polar group. You've got the um, uh, hydroxyl groups here. You've got the um, ether groups, uh, these groups there. And then you've got the uh, tertiary amine groups. So, so there's a really nice simulation paper. I haven't put the reference on here by Botis et al. And they conclude that for the, for the three different epoxies and hardener compensation, oh, sorry, I missed this out. In a dry, dry network, you get 35% of the hydroxyl groups form hydrogen bonds, while the remaining of the 65% 60, are free. And so when you add more water to this network, water uh, it diffuses in, and this added water forms more hydrogen bonds. And so the, you, can, you can conclude also that um, as you increase the mass of the water what, by 1%, uh, you also get a lowering of the TG. So that's quite important, you know, because we're always trying to optimize TG uh, by using the appropriate stoichiometry in these in these networks. So this is actually quite a big deal uh, by 10, deg 10 degrees, actually changing the polymer uh, dynamics of, the, of this material. So you can see a concomitant uh, reduction in storage modulus and tensile strength as well. 
So another technique that we like to think about, um, and uh, Suzanne has talked about depth profiling, and I'm sure Richard might talk about this a bit later on, is the idea of using um, how can we probe uh, uh, materials and understand the, the chemical species there in soft matter systems. So we, we like to use iron beam analysis, and Richard Jones has done quite a lot of that in the past, um, working with um, groups in the US, and also we work with um, sometimes with the Durham group. And you can hear you've got really good sensitivity to, to a lot of the, the lighter elements. And so you can use that to probe uh, compositional gradients inside thin and, and reasonably thick films, we'll say. And then also our go-to uh, technique of neutron reflectivity, which sadly has been quite hard to access during this last 18 months, two years, due to uh, the COVID restrictions. But we do have some data um, on, from some of the samples that Stephanie made and was measured at the ILR. So this is just a standard reflectometer, and you just you know, measure the reflection uh, uh, of the neutron beam uh, from a surface or interface. And these tend to have to be very thin films, you know, sub few hundred nanometers. And so these are the instruments that ISIS, INTER, POLREF, OFSPEC, SURF, and CRISP, I think, is now decommissioned. But there are other machines at the ILR. Um, yeah, here's, you know, that's INTER, and that's OFSPEC, which is very crazy and intense. There's loads of magnets that you don't actually need for this for this for the approach that we're using, but it does, looks very complicated, doesn't it? But there's your sort of standard silicon sample. And what you can get out from these is you can get this sort of depth-dependent uh, information from a, from a thin film. So here's a it's just a bog standard silicon wafer, and you can see a, a, you got this critical edge due to the total reflection. And that tells you about the difference between the, uh, the material that you're scatting from in terms of air, what the density of that material. And then you can also look at uh, putting um, polystyrene thin films on there. And you can see these fringe, fringes that to do with the thickness of, the, of that film. I've only just shown a very simple film. When you start to include, like when you've got density differences, you'll get all sorts of... Um, variation in these fringes and the, the shape of these curves, which is, is not hard, not, well, it's not easy to interpret by eye, but that's where the model fitting comes in to, to solve all the Fresnel equations. And there you can start to introduce roughness and you see damping of these oscillations. So, so those are the key oscillations that tell you about the, the thickness of your layer. And there's just a, a set of data on an on orga organic layer, but here we're looking at, at removing uh, 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 a very hydrogenous material, so you see a, a, an increase in this scattering length density, um, and you can fit that uh, using a sort of a very uh, freely available software. You can see the sort of nice data corresponds to the, to the, the, the fit, the black line corresponds to the actual data very nicely. And then <clears throat> here's my colleague, uh, Sasha Mikhailik from uh, the University of Sheffield, Kemp Town Chemistry. So, very fortunate in our labs to have access to one of these machines. This is an um, this is the sort of Zeus promotional photograph. But we have we have this machine um, in the basement of the chemistry at the moment. It's been um, it's misbehaving because it's got a broken pump. Uh, it, we have a, basically a liquid metal source that gets pumped around. Um, and for those of you who've done X-ray um, uh, lab-based X-ray measurements, you know you normally have a rotating anode, and that's got a limitation be be because you get um, basically ablation going on. So the way around that, in a very clever way, but also very they're prone to, to being um, uh, in a state of disrepair is that the Exilium people have come up with a way of having a, a liquid gallium metal uh, alloy that is pumped around. So you have a constantly renewing surface that gives you access to a, a really uh, sort of a... I only went to Dalsbury once, but people tell me that this is the sort of the synchrotron uh, equivalent of Dalsbury in a lab, which is a great thing um, to be able to go to some, something like that and have the sort of the, the back and forth of a... Um, of a, of a a very high powerful uh, x-ray source in your home lab um, very close to your chemistry and physics labs um, so you can actually go back and revisit and redo experiments which I think is very valuable and so yeah we can do uh, so here, here the camera is set up it's in a small angle x-ray configuration the camera is out here and we obviously we bring it closer up to look at uh, sort of interatomic distances versus you know a few hundreds of nanometers and so what's a way of uh, profiling I haven't, I haven't included the, the extra reflectivity on here, but this is another way of doing it. You can do extra reflectivities. You can also do grazing incidence uh, uh, diffraction as well. So you can look at stuff uh, uh, in, in the vertical, sort of uh, in the perpendicular, in the, uh, sort of, um, and then here's the lateral information in this, in this plot as well. So you can, this, this is looking at um, conjugated materials, but you get the idea that you can, you can start to do uh, really neat tricks. And the beauty about the, um, the sort of grazing incidence approach is that by how you tilt the sample, uh, the angle at which you approach gives you that, um, 
Suzanne was talking about the, one of the, the limitations for FTIR is your sampling distance. So here you can tune your sampling distance in grazing incidents. So you can be really, really surface sensitive or you can be sort of surface bulk or bulk sensitive. So depending on how you, so if you do a series of different angles, you can say I'm at the top, I'm at the bottom. And then if you flip your sample over, you can see what's on the bottom as well. So I think that's a really powerful way in which you can probe um, molecular um, composition or molecular order uh, uh, using uh, x-rays. And I like this cartoon because I remember the Pink Panther cartoons back in the day. And I think it really shows up really nicely what is the point of what's important about scattering. And I think the fact is that you need to have intrinsic contrast or you need to create contrast. Um, and I think that's key. Uh, so a lot of the experiments, and I think that's possibly where some of the, the x-ray experiments have fallen down is the fact that we don't have enough contrast uh, in some of the epoxy systems. So here you can see there's no electron contrast and you can't see the pink panther. Here there is some uh, difference in electron density or uh, in electron density for, for x-rays and then scattering length density for, for neutrons. And so a way around that, and uh, my colleague Richard is persuading us to, well, he's not persuading us, I think he's convinced us that we should buy some deuterated Tejiba. So these guys here, um, back in the day, made some deuterated Tejiba with this, this jeffamine, and they were able to see these sort of, it sort of looks a little bit shaky, the data, but there is a peak in the dry state that's about 0.15 um, reciprocal angstroms, which is, can I even calculate, 40, 40 angstroms, so four nanometers. And then they've managed to swell it with acetone and look at the shift in that. So I think these are the kinds of experiments where you need to, you know, be able to see this. Um, uh, you need to start to think about, you know, making, having intrinsic contrast between your epoxy and your amine. Or in this instance, you could think about um, hoping that you get solvents preferentially going to one of the domains. And so I've been thinking about this network structure, um, and I don't think they show it in there. There is a peak or a vague hump here. Um, and this goes back to some of the work that um, Alan Windle did years ago and looking at what's going on inside these. Um, so this is a series of different uh, amines, mono and di uh, functional amines. And here's the, this, this peak, which uh, Alan Windle and his colleague called the, they called it the polymerization peak. So this peak is really quite important, I think, in terms of uh, they've watched it develop and go up in intensity. So this is them the watching this um, point for us of on peak row. And it wasn't there. It's not there looking at the, the raw materials or the precursor materials before they're, 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 um, uh, you mix them and, and create a network. Um, so that's, that, that's the peak. And then what they've shown is that the intensity of this peak is optimized when you have uh, optimized stoichiometry. They call it P rather than whatever you want to call stoichiometry. So this, this is a really good way, I think, of actually monitoring you know, um, how good you know, have you got an optimum network? So there are instances in the future where we want to make optimum networks. So I think this is the strategy for actually being able to, to do that, to be able to make, you know, this sort of uh, a combinatorial screen that my colleague Francis probably at the back will want to do, Francis German, uh, Sheffield. So he'll be wanting to understand how is this intensity, this peak, have I made a really good network? And I think that's the, 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 the cue that he needs to be able to do that. And then that's just their rationale for this, this peak. It's to do with the space in between the, these chains. And they, they seem to think that this, this 0.4 peak is quite so 16 to 17 angstroms. And it favors this sort of type two um, uh, chains, this type two network formation. And that's their sort of cartoon of what they think the, the, the epoxy network that they've been working looks at. So we see it in some of our materials as well. And just to say, um, I chatted to this guy, I don't know if anyone knows, uh, Rick. I can never pronounce his name, Rick Byer, who was based at Sheffield uh, for, for a year prior to uh, the, the pandemic. And I think he's going to come back. But he's been looking at the Army Research Labs. I just wanted to show this because I think it's a really nice data set in the sense that he did a, a, a ternary phase diagram of the Jiva, these two Jeffamines and Packham, and showed that, uh, you know, he has this, his peak at point four, this polymerization peak is out there, uh, slightly um, altered. But uh, he starts to see this, this, what I would call this small angle signal due to uh, phase separation in his network. So he is starting to see what I said at the outset was some sort of uh, outliers in terms of um, phase separation in, in, in networks. But um, here's his ternary phase diagram. But I'll come, so he's basically mapped out um, compositional space by adding in more of this uh, D4000 Jeffamine. And they're interested in it at the Army Labs. They're not, they're not, yeah. 
ballistic materials, so shock absorbing materials. They're not uh, they're not shying behind you know secrecy. They really are trying to make things they want to put on on soldiers in the field um, or tanks and things like that. And just to say that, that, that they've actually correlated, which is, I think is quite nice. This is some uh, measure of the, of the intensity of that phase separation in this kind of system. And they've correlated it with this KE50, something to do with how, you know, how good a, a material it is in terms of it being a ballistic material. So they've got really strong correlation between that kind of thing. So I think that kind of uh, analysis is quite important. What they don't have is what is the volume fraction of, of phase separated material inside their systems. And I'd argue that this is possibly the best uh, TM I've seen of, of a phase separated epoxy network. Uh, and I can actually see the scattering pattern from it as well. So I think I'm sort of possibly now convinced that there is phase separation in, in epoxy. So this is actually the pure uh, two component, the Jeeva and Pack, and this is the zero phase here in the black line. They've carefully, <laughs> again, they've, uh, they've sort of swamped it with the other ones, but you can sort of see that as you increase the fraction of the other D4000 Pack, it, it goes up. And then it goes down, and then you probably get some sort of uh, macro phase separation between the two. Um, so yeah, I think where are we at? We're starting to understand the, the, the networks and think thinking about how these uh, networks form and how they form by, by phase separation. And uh, I use the cartoon that was well, not the cartoon. I use the, the physical model that was generated by my colleague Dr. Berg in the audience, and she's smiling because she's seen it. Because um, I think it's a really nice demonstration of what we think is going on inside some of these networks when they form, if, if that is the case. But it would be really nice to see in some of the networks we're doing with AXO to be able to follow this pattern using the kit at Sheffield as well. So I think uh, that's where we're at in terms of trying to understand, you know, uh, how can we, you know, limit the, or can we, can we trap these? Um, if they do form a spinel network and we know that water must permeate through these at some point, can we limit the tortuosity uh, or restrict the, the, the migration of water? Um, and again, I haven't talked about putting fillers in, but they are really good barriers at stopping water as well. So I think, you know, there's many strategies that can be used to try and reduce the mobility of water in these kinds of materials that um, I think is really important. And with that, I'm going to say thank you to all these great people here, Tony Ryan, Melody Oven, Stephanie Berg, Francis, Joe, Derek at Sheffield, these people are involved in I think, uh, some of the ID2 work I didn't put that in the end. But Neil Williams, who's retiring at, um, very shortly as well. Tony Wright, Marco, and then Simon Gibbons, who's been a real, um, really good friend to us at Sheffield during the, the outset of this project and before that as well, with his uh, uh, collaborations with uh, interactions with Richard, Darren Coughlin, uh, who sort of helped me as well in, in early Axon Nobel interactions, and Steve Knox, Alec, and of course Patrick Fairclough, who's been a really good colleague at Sheffield, and of course Stuart who's been driving a lot of the work, and Richard, Suzanne, um, and Charlie as well. Congratulations on your new job as well. So with that, I'll say thank you to you all for your attention. Um, great. Thank you very much, Andy. Any questions for Andy? That's Say lunch. Hello, Patrick. Hi So you get fake separate. So you get the phase separation. So traditionally, you, you, there'd be some chemical difference between the species that get yeah. the phase separation. But the things are reacting together. Is it kind of like a, a polyurethane kind of phase separation, that kind of, that kind of structure, do you think? Or do you think it's more um, like a, a coarser structure like you get in a, in a, a polymer polymer phase separation? I don't know, Patrick. I need to measure it for these my, our own systems. But I think... Um, that will pan out from the. I think. I think we probably need to go down the, the route of either getting a, a deuterated material and seeing that. I think in, in some sands measurements and Richard's giving me the thumbs up. So yeah, I think. Uh, I think that will 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 win out, and I think uh, you'll be able to help me probably in the analysis as well. But yeah. Okay. Right. OK, so this these are questions from Douglas Mills, um, who is watching online. Um, if you know what DNI areas are, these are the things which were which have uh, apparently uh, differing uh, conductivity when you immerse them in, in water of different salt concentrations. Does this give you any feeling for how the network heterogeneity impacts upon uh, ionic conductivity? Uh, that's a good question, isn't it? So I think. Um if we have a model based on the scattering, for instance, of of our uh, our 
nanostructure network size and the level of connectivity, I think that could be correlated with, with those kinds of measurements. And, you know, you know, we'd probably be able to look at a trend if we, if we had a, um, I don't think it would be able to predict numerically that kind of thing, which is what we would like. But I think, I think, um, that's the kind of, um, yeah, that's the kind of thing where we're at. I think, yeah, we could we could work out, you know, if if we know uh, what our materials are, are and we have uh, electron densities for, for them, we could be able to try and probably do some, you know, work out compositionally probably what they are. But I don't think we'll be able to get, you know, back out, you know, that much. It's more conductive. I think I think that's where probably the fine detail of, of the IRAFM comes in. Um, and if we do get to resolutions of 10 nanometers, we know that, you know, this is a sample uh, that, I think that's the beauty of scattering. We could screen more samples than is possible with IRAFM. So we can screen a whole, like, you know, combinatorial space and then say to Suzanne, this one has got, you know, domains of this size. Um, you know, you and your colleagues go in and image this and try and see if you can do some of the sort of the, not just the IRAFM, but then the kind of Kelvin force, you know, the measuring the conductivity of these these um, these d- domains, I think, uh, under humidities as well. So that would be the, the linkage. I think I think I think with all these techniques, they don't just stand alone on, on one, um, you know, they need, you know, they need a partner in terms of, you know, a backup measurement to be able to validate. Um, it's, just, it's a correlative. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, a I mean, it's, it's, it's the big buzzword from microscopists is it's correlative microscopy and it's, yeah. it's correlative nanoanalysis but, in a sense. But I think that kind of um, steering design is, is, is the way that we should go here. Yeah. Any further questions? I guess just one one sort of comment, thought from us about these. I mean, you know, going back to Douglas's one about DNI areas, with lots of these things, we have, I guess, two, and it comes back to the other talks today, resolution and contrast. And I mean, deuterating will certainly increase our contrast, but we're still going to have a resolution limit. And then when it comes back to things like electrochemical testing, we potentially, you know, even local techniques do not have a very. So I was wondering, I mean, once we see the various different mechanisms, how much chance do we have in, um, in polymer science of scaling those regions so they're easier to see by more bulk techniques, electrochemical or whatever? Well, I think, I think you, know, you know, if you know something's there, we can measure, we can measure you know, nanometer size domains in, in, in with our scattering techniques. Then, yeah, we can tell you there are, you know, in this, in this, measure, in this sample here, there are 10% of, of these uh, Following fraction of these domains and they're of this size, and we think that um, uh, they've got this sort of level of connectivity. I think that's the kind of um, yeah, that's the kind of where we're at. But I, I think uh, I think what what more did you want from me? Well, I, I guess I'm trying to. I mean, I, 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 I think yeah, the answer, the answer, no. But I mean, I, I guess what I was thinking is, you know, once once we've actually proved these really exist, yeah. How much scope are we going to have to get them out of it so we get either one phase or the other? Well, I think um, that's that's looking at the phase diagram, and that's that's. I mean, yeah, we have yeah. you know we have plenty of levers to control in terms of you know uh, of 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 understanding. I mean, there's a, a whole wealth of physics, and my colleague uh, Dr. Berg, for her PhD, was looking at you know controlling the phase diagram. So you know you, you put down an acetate sheet, and it's and it's clear, and you process it in a different way. You get a very strongly structured white structure. So I think there are many different and you know, we've regaled about what the different, you know, um, strategies for controlling phase separation, your temperature, yep. solvent, you know, all these kinds of quenches, you know, strong thermal quenches. And I think, you know, they, they can all play their part. Um, so rather, rather than trying to ever go down in resolution, we should use the, the polymer science to, to, go to, up guide, size. to guide morphology. Yeah, yeah to guide yeah. morphology. Okay, thank you. Okay.